Let's uh, introduce uh, our speaker for today, Jeff Kloon, for his uh, formal defense for a degree of uh, PhD. Uh, I uh, met Jeff when he arrived uh, many years ago as a philosophy graduate student uh, and has moved over, obviously, to uh, computer science. But, you know, in the end, PhD is Doctorate of Philosophy, so you really can't <laughs> leave it. Uh, so, uh, just going to talk about his research that he's done, uh, Evolving Artificial Neural Networks with Generative Encodings, inspired by developmental biology. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, before I begin, I'd like to get to some very well-deserved, let's see if this works. Very well-deserved uh, acknowledgement for the people that I've worked with here that have been uh, fantastic. First and foremost, Charles Afria, who is my co-advisor along with Rob Pennock, who you just heard from, as well as committee members Eric Goodman and Rich Lenzi. I'd also like to thank Bill McKinley and Ken Stanley. And as most of you in this room know, uh, the people up here are just intellectual giants. And it's been a privilege and a pleasure for me to have worked with them and gotten to know them and become friends with them. And uh, the good thing about working with giants is you get to climb up onto their shoulders and take a view. And so that view has been uh, very awe-inspiring and uh, it's been a you know, great experience. So thank you for sharing that with me. I'd also like to thank the members of the Digital Evolution Lab, many of whom are pictured here and are present here. Uh, thank you all. It's been simply fantastic learning from you and getting to know you. And uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you for everything over the years. I'd also like to thank the funding sources that have made it possible. I also quickly want to thank the founder of our field, John Holland. <laughs> <laughs> and his Google image search really helped me find <laughs> That's a little inside joke for those in our lab. Um, I also want to thank uh, my friends and family who have been absolutely tremendous over the years, many of whom are here today and some of whom couldn't make it. I particularly want to thank John Weinbach, who came in from New York, who's back here who uh, traveled, the world, <laughs> traveled the world with me while I was debating whether or not I should commit my life to this technology I thought was awesome, which is called evolutionary computation. And he encouraged me to follow that dream, and so he's part of the reason I'm standing here. Um, I'd also like to thank my family over here, who you can thank for the food, uh, who did all the work to get this together. Um, my brother Kevin flew in, he flew in the longest. He came in from Italy by way of Spain to be here today, so uh, he's a little jet lagged. Um, also, I'd like to thank my parents, who uh, really, from the earliest possible age, instilled just an insatiable intellectual curiosity in me. And more than anybody else here are the reason that I'm standing here today. So, thank you to them. I'd also like to thank Sarah, who is over here. Uh, Sarah's been my partner in everything that I've done over the last five years, both personal and professional. And uh, everything that I touch, the papers I write, the presentations I give are better because of the brilliant insight she gives me as we discuss these things and read manuscripts and go over talks and everything. So if you see anything you like in this presentation, she probably deserves the credit. Uh, the faults I'll take, those are all me. Okay, on to the science, as long as this thing works. So one of the major goals in my field, one of the things that motivates me, is trying to synthetically evolve forms that are as complicated as the animals we see in the natural world. So eventually, I'd like to be able to try to evolve things like this. Now, we're a long way off, but the technique that we use is to create evolutionary processes inside of computers where generations can happen in milliseconds. And we try to see if we can get these evolutionary processes to evolve complicated forms, such as jaguars, hawks, and human brains, eventually. And there's two main motivations for that lofty long-term goal. The first is that we understand things when we try to build them. I can't tell you how many times in my life Rich has told me, oh, all you need to do to perform this statistical test is go home and do X, Y, and Z. Or my mom said, oh, this recipe is easy, you just do this, this, and this. And I said, great, I know exactly how to do that. And then I go home and I try to do it, and I realize there's ingredients I forgot to buy, there's steps that I don't understand or never even conceived of. Frequently, it's not until we try to build something that we really understand how hard it is and everything that's involved in producing that thing. 
So um, by trying to create jaguars or trying to create evolutionary processes that evolve things like jaguars, we really learn what's involved in doing that. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount of engineering uses. Obviously, if we can evolve things at this level of sophistication, the engineering uh, purposes are basically limitless. You know, we have artificial intelligence, we have agile robots, etc. So the question, of course, is what are the key ingredients in the natural soup, if you will, that allows evolution to evolve things of great complexity? And can we take those key ingredients and get them into our evolutionary algorithm? So before I get to the experiments that I've done, I'm going to quickly go through some of the background and the key concepts we'll need to understand the science that I've done. And one of the most important is what an evolutionary algorithm is. And the general idea is that evolutionary algorithms are just pro evolutionary processes inside of a computer. So if you want to evolve something, the first thing that you need to do is you need to figure out how to encode it. And so if I wanted to evolve a table, for example, I'd have to figure out how do I represent a table in a genome? And the simplest way would just be to specify the length of each leg independently, and then the width and the length maybe of the surface. And then if I want to generate an individual, I just generate numbers inside this genome, and then I know how to build this table. If I then want to create a population of tables, I simply generate random numbers for all those genomes, and then I get a population of organisms. I then score the organisms according to some criteria, maybe whether or not the table is stable, and then I choose, based on those scores, which organisms get to be the parents in the next generation. And then to generate the next generation, I simply take the organism here, and I mutate some part of its genome, which changes part of the phenotype, and now I have an organism that resembles its parent, but is slightly different. <coughs> to get the whole population, I repeat that for all of the organisms that are parents. And that's basically it. At a very high level, that's an evolutionary algorithm, and you cycle that process until you reach some endpoint that you're happy with. Now there are many different parts to this problem, and I've worked on, on many of these intersections, but in today's talk I'm going to focus on the encoding. So how do you best represent uh, a, a solution or an organism in a genotype so you can evolve complex forms? And when I talk about encodings, I'm specifically talking about not only how the information is stored in the genome, but also the process by which you go from this information to a phenotype. So it's the genome plus the process. And there are two classes of encoding, direct and generative. Direct encoding is when every part of a, of a genotype, such as this information here, independently specifies for a part of the phenotype. So for tables, for example, this information, the length of each leg is specified individually. And if you think about how mutations affect these genomes, it happens in really uncoordinated ways. A mutation will change a leg, and the table you know, is kind of wonky and like you know, falling all over the place. Um, and the idea is that it's very difficult for uh, evolution in a direct encoding to have coordinated mutational effects, such as shortening all the legs. And since all of these are being selected against because they're spilling your beer, then evolution is constantly pulling the phenotypes back over here, and it's hard for evolution to cross this fitness valley and get to this phenotype over here. Generative encodings, in contrast, allow information in a genome to be reused throughout the phenotype. So you can specify the length of legs once, and then that information could apply to all four legs. At that point, it becomes trivial to go from this table to this table, because only one thing needs to be mutated, and you get this coordinated change in the organism. So there are many reasons that I'm interested in using generative encodings. And one of them are the coordinated mutational effects that I mentioned. The other is scalability. You can search in a very, very small, low-dimensional uh, search space, but you can still get a hugely complicated uh, phenotype. So for example, every one of you has about 25,000 genes in your genome, yet there are trillions of cells and there are tons of parts per cell. There's this hugely complicated phenotype from this relatively small genome. So you can search a small thing and still get the big thing. Another important thing is that you can get modularity, regularity, and hierarchy out of generative encodings. And those are all really important design principles that exist not only in natural organisms, but also in engineered designs that we'd like to get and you can get those with and without variation. So the property that I'm going to focus on in this talk is regularity. And all regularity is is basically a regular pattern, something being repeated potentially with and without variation. So in this hand here, which is a little hard to see, but there's a pattern of a finger that is repeated over and over and over again with some variation. And that regular pattern is a form of regularity. More specifically, regularity involves the reuse of information. 
So I could, for example, in this form here, have the information that only specifies the left side over here. And then I can reuse that information to generate the right side. It will work. The right side of this organism. And what that means is that I get kind of twice the phenotype, if you will, for half the information. That also means that if the genome error is compressible, I can take this phenotype and compress it down to a smaller amount of information. Now, this is a highly regular creature that has left-right symmetry, but you could also have maybe a little irregularity in this animal here, as is the case with the fiddler crab. So this organism here has two completely different claws. It's almost comical, really, when you look at it. But what's interesting is that this what this means is that somewhere in the genome there's more information necessary. Some information has to encode for the difference between these two. You can't reuse the same code completely for this claw here. But what's also interesting is that this example here, this creature, is one of the paradigmatic examples in nature of asymmetry and irregularity. But yet, it's still a highly regular creature. It's mostly got left-right symmetry, it's got repeated legs, it's, <coughs> it's very rare in nature to see things like this. <laughs> we just don't, at the macroscopic scale, we don't see these irregular creatures. Nature just uses regularity in almost everything that it does. So I've been talking about regularity in body form, but I also want to mention that there's regularities in problems or in the environment. So when you're a kid, you learn how fruits ripen, and maybe you learn that for a banana. That also applies to an apple or a lime. Gen you can reuse information because the, there are regularities in the world. Or if you're trying to learn a problem, for example, how to play tic-tac-toe, if you learn a strategy that works on the row, that will also work on the column. If you learn a strategy that works on one diagonal, of course, that's going to apply to the other diagonal. And the same works for edges. So in this problem are multiple different regularities that somebody who's learning how to play this could independently learn and exploit. Same thing with an evolutionary algorithm or an artificial intelligence agent. Now, generally codings have been used uh, repeatedly, and they perform very well because they can, sh they can produce regularities. So here's an example of tables that were evolved with a direct encoding, these four here, and a generative encoding. And what you see on the left here is that these tables are highly irregular. You don't see repeated themes, you don't see symmetries, you don't see serial repetition. But on the right here, you see uh, four-way symmetry or left-right symmetry. You see the same motif here repeated in some variation because it's in a different context. And so there's a nice visual illustration of the difference in creature or in forms that you can get between these two encodings. Another example of this is worth the work by Carl Sims and also Greg Hornby here, where you involve creatures that run around in a 3D world. And again, a lot of regularity. Here's left-right symmetry. Here's re repetition of a serial motif which is another type of regularity. And down here, you also get repetition of components. So generative encodings have been shown to be very promising, but it's always on highly regular problems that we see them tested and we see their, their benefits touted. And so what we don't know is how they perform on problems that have little or no regularity. And so that's because it's been uh, not been tested, these things have not been tested across a continuum of regularity. So if you look at these plots down here, here are two hypothetical plots that could be the way the generative encodings work. So here, where regularity is high on this axis, the generative encoding performs extremely well. But this is all we know right now. What we don't know is as we scale regularity down, does, do, does the performance of gener generative encodings fall off a cliff, such that they can only perform well on their home turf? Or is it the case that they can exploit intermediate amounts of regularity as we scale regularity down? And this is going to be the central question that we're investigating today. So the game plan is that I'm doing a case study in this dissertation of one generative encoding and a direct encoding control. And then I'm going to test those two encodings on three different problems as I scale the regularity of the problem. And we'll be able to compare the differences in performance. So the generative encoding I chose is Hyperdeep. And the reason I chose it is because it has a very good direct encoding control that allows for fair comparisons because it's shown to be very promising on a number of problems. I won't get into that, but it's shown empirically to work really well in the last couple of years. But most importantly, because it imports a new important concept in the development of biology. So I think it moves us down the road towards a synthetically evolving, really complicated natural <coughs> creatures. And, and therefore, I want to test out how good it does on problems that aren't perfectly regular. And the, the concept from development of biology is based on how nature evolves complicated forms. 
So one of the most fascinating questions I think in science is how do you go from one fertilized embryo to you? How does every cell in your body know what type of cell to become? How does a cell know to become a skin cell, or a kidney cell, an eye cell, or a liver cell? Every cell has the same genome, but yet it knows what kind of thing to turn into. And the way that nature does that, on the, uh, by and large, is that it tries to figure out, if you will, the global information, the XYZ coordinates of every cell. And then cells, once they know where they are, then know what to become. So their cell fate is a function of their geometric location. But of course, cells in a body can't just ask for their XYZ coordinates objectively. So what nature does is it builds up these complicated chemical gradients and geometric coordinate frames to basically cue cells to figure out what, where they are and therefore what they should become. Are you in a liver? Are you in an eye? Etc. So here is a picture of a Drosophila, which is a fruit fly embryo. And you can see, for example, that there's a gradient of blue to red, <coughs> which tells cells in the organism, am I toward the head or am I toward the tail? And you can not just have one gradient of information, you can have multiple different gradients laying on top of each other, and the cells can kind of cue into those different signals simultaneously. So here we, repeat, we see a repeating theme that might say, you're in something that should become a segment. So here's a cartoon drawn up by uh, developmental biologist Sean Carroll that I really think does a good job of explaining how this works. So imagine that you have this embryo, the same embryo, this is three shots of the same embryo, looking at three different chemicals in that same embryo. Imagine if you have a gene that says, I'm only going to turn on when pattern A, when chemical A is present, chemical B is not present, and chemical C is not present. And the only places in this embryo where that's true are in these squares here. And then cells could say, oh, maybe I should become a vertebra if I'm in one of these cells, or in one of these squares. So what evolution does is it takes pre-existing geometric patterns, combines them together to produce increasingly complicated geometric patterns that then can tell the cells what to become and what to do. And so an example of that is in the Drosophila embryo, you've got this anterior-posterior blue to red gradient, you've got this repeating green um, pattern, and a cell can say, if I'm in the blue area and I'm in green, become a head segment. Or if I'm in the red area and I'm in green, become a tail segment, etc. And that's effectively what the Hox genes are doing, which are very famous genes you may have heard of. So if you look through the developing world, you see that these kind of complex geometric coordinate uh, patterns are really the lingua franca of developmental biology. All throughout developing organisms, we see these geometric patterns that are used to produce the, the final phenotype. So the hybrid encoding that I'm using takes that general idea. It's going to make phenotypic components a function of their location in geometry. And the way that it does that is by simply asking the genome, what should I do at every cell? Now in hyperd, if we wanted to evolve a picture, for example, each pixel on this canvas can have an xy coordinate. And we don't actually need to specify that uh, evolution figure out how to provide x and y. We can just give x and y directly to the cells. So we basically go to the genome and we should say, what should happen here at cell 2 comma 1? How about 2 comma 2? 2 comma 3? And we iteratively go through every pixel on this image here, and we get a value coming out of the genome, and that specifies what happens at that cell. And you might get a picture that looks something like this, which doesn't look terribly complex or natural. <clears throat> so one of the insights of hyperd is that if we want certain properties in our phenotypes, such as left-right symmetry, then we can provide math functions to evolution that evolve into the genome that produce these properties. So if you want left-right symmetry, you could have a Gaussian of the x-axis. Or if you want a repeating theme, you could have a sine of the y-axis. And so there's different mathematical functions that can mutate into this genome that evolution can use to produce these, you know, these properties in the final phenotype. So Ken Stanley down in Florida built a website that uses that encoding to evolve images and then um, asked uh, visitors to the website to select those images based on what they prefer. And the results are these images here. And what we can see is that this encoding, when you evolve something with this encoding, you can get creatures that look natural. Some of you in the back of the room might actually think that that's a picture of a butterfly, even though it's a synthetically evolved form. So you see left-right symmetry, you see repeating segments, you see coordinated mutational effects along a lineage, an evolutionary lineage. And I also happen to know when I go in and tweak the genomes of these guys that you get coordinated mutational effects. For example, if you mutate this, all of the appendages get longer or shorter, etc. Of course, I'm not interested in this talk in evolving 
um, regularities in bodies. I'm interested in evolving regularities in brains. But the principle is the same. Your brain has left-right symmetry, and it has many regular neural wiring motifs that we'd like to get. So to evolve something big and complicated, hopefully we're going to be able to get these kind of regularities into this brain. Now, the way that we evolve brains in computers is by evolving things called artificial neural networks, which are abstractions of brains. Brains are very complicated, but they can be boiled down to and abstracted into nodes, which are these circles here, and connections between the nodes. And the idea is that you've got input nodes that take in information from the environment, hidden nodes, which perform computation at intermediate stages within the brain, and then the output nodes, which, for example, control your joints. <coughs> And the key is that the, each one of these connections between nodes has what's called a weight. And that weight is simply a number that can either amplify or diminish the information that comes through. And the weights that make up a neural network determine how, what process, information processing goes on within the brain and basically the result of the overall function of the brain. So the key is how do we determine what the weights are for all of these connections in a neural network. And the way that Hyperne does that, very similar to the images, is it makes the weights a function of their geometric location. So each link here has a node that it comes from and a node that it goes to. You can't really see it, but there are Cartesian numbers on these axes here. So when I basically go to the genome, I, I go to the genome and I say, what should be the weight for the connection between node 20 and, and 20? And I get a value out. And if there's another layer, then I can get a second value out for the next layer. And then I say, how about the connection between 20 and 10? And then I iteratively go through and ask, query the genome, what should be the weight at each one of the links in all possible connections in the network? What I want you to envision is that just like in the 2D images where you see all those properties such as left-right symmetry and repeating patterns, Hyperd is now painting those kind of patterns in four-dimensional link weight space, brain neural connection space, if you will. It's got those same properties. At least that's what we hope, and we're going to see if that's true. Now, I need to compare generative encoding to a direct encoding. So the control is what's called fixed topology need, uh, which is exactly the same as hyperd, except that every link is independently evolved. So mutations <coughs> will just change one of these numbers and change one of those connections. They won't uh, have global effects throughout the genome. OK, we're now ready for the science. So thank you for bearing with me for that background section. What I hope to, what I hope to show you here is that generative encoding exploit problem regularity which allows them to increasingly outperform direct encoding controls as the regularity of problems goes up. And then we're also going to show you that they do that by producing more regular brains and more regular behaviors. They're also more evolvable. Now those are all the plus sides of, of generative encodings with respect to regularity. But I'm also going to investigate a downside of regularity, which is that if something is too biased towards regular solutions, then it has difficulty on problems that have some irregularity involved in them. But first, to compare general versus direct on these three problems. So the first problem that I'm going to introduce, I invented <coughs> to test how well evolution can evolve regular neural nets. It's called the target weights problem because I'm going to pick a neural net. I'm going to pick all of the weights in that neural net. I'm going to simply see if evolution can match that target neural net. Now, the most regular version of that problem, I pick one number at random, and all of the weight weights in the brain are going to be that same number. So it's a highly regular problem because every connection needs to be the same. And then I can lower the regularity of the problem by decreasing the number of weights that are the identical uh, value and, and just setting the remaining weights to be random values. So by the end, there's no expected regularity in the problem because every weight is generated independently. Now, this problem is intuitive because we know what's going on. It allows me to scale the regularity, but it's very simple because it doesn't have epistasis. And epistasis is simply when there's interactions between the components. So changing, for example, one of these values won't change the optimal value for all the other connections. Each link is its independent problem. And the data on target weights indicates that uh, Hyperd can exploit the regularity of the problem. So to help you see this, this is error on this axis. So lower is better. And here are the different treatments for Hyperd that have different regularities, from purple down here to pink. And what we see is that the performance of hyperlead perfectly correlates with the regularity of the problem. When the problem is more regular, hyperlead has almost no error on the problem, the most regular version. And then as regularity decreases, its performance falls off. What's also interesting is that the direct encoding FTNE, which I did the same number of trials for, 
is are these black lines here, which are all on top of each other. And what that indicates is that the direct encoding is blind to the regularity of the problem. It cannot see or exploit it. The next problem that I invented to test the regularity of networks is called bit mirroring. And it is intuitive, also can scale the regularity, but it adds in the component of epistasis. There's interactions between the parts, which makes that much more realistic, but also much more challenging. And the general idea, here's a solution network here. Each input node is going to have one target output node. So for example, this input here is matched with this input. I'm going to put information into the inputs here, and the only thing the network has to do is produce that information at the target outputs. So it's just got to find which is its target output. Now that's intuitively simple, but it's actually a very hard problem for evolution. Because evolution has to turn on these green links and then turn off all of the red links. And the reason that's so difficult is because, for example, this connection here, if you have an uh, origin <coughs> where this is red, and a mutation changes this link to be green, the, the network is now one step closer to the actual solution. But it may not get a fitness boost because if incorrect wires are coming in here, the output might still not be correct. So it's a very challenging problem for evolution. Now there are three types of regularity in this problem. I'm going to first mention two of them, which is uh, within column regularity and within row regularity. I start the experiment with all three types of regularity high, and I first decrease within column regularity, which means I just decrease the expectation that targets are in the same column. I then further decrease the, the expectation of how many targets are going to be in the same row. And what that allows me to do is scale regularity from being totally high when targets are in the same row and column to totally irregular with respect to these two types of regularity. And what we see is when we look at the data on these uh, on this problem. Here, performance is now uh, higher is better. The direct encoding, actini, is a scale regularity from low to high is completely blind, again, to the regularity of the problem. There's no statistical significant differences between any of those treatments. The generative encoding, on the other hand, is a scale regularity from low to high, increasingly exploits the regularity of the problem such that eventually it perfectly solves the problem in most treatments. And so what we see is that the generative code is exploiting intermediate amounts of problem regularity. It's not falling off a cliff once the problem has some irregularity. And that allows you to increasingly outperform the direct encoding control. Now, th this versus this is statistically significant. This versus this is significantly different. And these guys are better than the direct encoding, which means that it is significantly exploiting the regularity of the problem. Now, the third type of regularity in this problem I call inherent regularity. And that is, for each node, there's one pattern that the evolution needs to figure out. And that's turning one link on, the green link, and turning every other link off. Now that needs to be repeated for each one of the nodes on the input sheet. So obviously the more nodes you have on that input sheet, the more regular that problem is, because the more times you need to repeat that pattern. So I can decrease the inherent regularity by decreasing the grid size. And what we find is that up here, hyperlink has an advantage over the direct encoding. But as we decrease the grid size, for hyperlink's advantage it diminishes, and then it crosses over to the point that direct, the direct encoding starts to do better. So once the problem contains a, a sufficient amount of irregularity, then the direct encoding uh, crosses over and starts to do better. What's interesting is if you put all the data together from the previous slides onto one slide, as I've done here, you can see that hyperlink is not only exploiting regularity within one type, but it can exploit multiple concurrent regularities, like that tic-tac-toe example. So when the problem was really irregular with target weights, the direct encoding had the advantage. But once I add inherent regularity, and then further add row, and then further add column, then the performance advantage of the generative encoding increasingly um, widens, which very increases. Which means that uh, this is a really good sign, because the engineering problems are likely to have multiple different types of regularity and you want your generative encoding to independently identify and exploit those types of regularity. And we're seeing evidence for that. The final problem that I studied is called the quadruped controller problem. And the first two I invented as diagnostic problems to help me see what's going on. The final one, I just wanted to pick a problem off the shelf from engineering. Go find a hard, difficult engineering problem and test if the generative encodings do well in that problem. Now, I wanted a problem that had some regularity to it, so there could be left-right symmetry here, or front-back symmetry, or diagonal symmetry, but I wasn't going to constrain it to figure out which type of symmetry. And the, the goal is to evolve a gate for this controller. So how fast can we get this robot to run across a landscape? 
Now, typically, people have tried to evolve these uh, gates for controllers before, and evolution can't solve the problem when it tries to solve the entire problem. <coughs> and the reason it's so hard for evolution is because the evolutionary algorithms do not see the regularity of this problem. They don't see that there's four legs and you can do something similar for each leg. So what researchers have done is basically said, well, I'll just manually cut up the problem and simplify it for evolution. So I'll make one brain and then I'll use it for all four legs. But they have to manually do that. Another thing that you could do is have one brain for the front two legs and one brain for the back two legs, or whatever your, flate, your fancy is. The problem is that this constrains the solutions you might get, because for example, here you can't evolve left-right symmetry, and it also may miss regularities. As we throw this, these algorithms at really difficult problems, we don't know all the regularities that are out there. It would be better if evolution could discover those. So the brain we actually use, the neural network for this robot, has inputs of the current angles of the legs in rows, it's got the inputs from each joint in columns, as well as a touch sensor for each one of the legs, and the pitch, roll, and yaw of the torso, as well as a sine wave that provides a regular clock. We can scale the regularity of this problem by adding faulty joints. And a faulty joint is one where if I request angle, say, 42, I might get actually angle 43.5. So I just add an error to each one of the requested angles, and that's the, the error in the joint. Now that error is constant throughout the run, and what it does is it emulates a noisy manufacturing process. So maybe the plant just spit out a joint that's a little bit off, but it's consistently off. I tested the most regular version of the problem with no faulty joints, as well as 1, 4, 8, and 12 irregular joints, which is all of the joints, which means that the problem is totally irregular with, in, with respect to joints. And what we see in the data is that once again, Hyperdate exploits the problem regularity. So as performance goes from the most irregular version of the, of the problem with 8 or 12 faulty joints all the way up to 0 faulty joints, the performance of Hyperdate continuously increases. We also see that the direct encoding is more blind to the regularity. Regularity matters less to the direct encoding. Also of interest is the fact that Hyperdate beats the direct encoding on the two most regular versions of the problem, but loses to it on the two most irregular versions of the problem. So once again, we see this crossover point where once the problem becomes irregular enough, the direct encoding wins. So I've now shown you on three different problems that the generative encoding can ex they exploit problem regularity to increasingly outperform the direct encoding control. Now the question is how? How is it able to do that? And the answer is it does that by producing regular behaviors and regular brains. So here is the gate of the best hyper uh, uh run. And what you see is that there's a lot of regularity and coordination here. The three back legs are, are working together, and the front leg is out of phase. <coughs> there's also, I'm going to show you that again, there's also a repeated movement. There's one basic behavior that's repeated over and over and over again, which is another type of regularity. And that type of regularity is important because that might lead to more general gates. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, then it's likely that your past success is going to predict your future success. But if you're constantly doing something different, you have no idea what's going to come down the road which means that these might generalize better. The, direct, the best gate from the direct encoding is actually also pretty regular. You see the legs moving together. Now this gate doesn't perform as well as this gate, and it has a little bit less regularity, but it's actually very atypical for the, uh, the direct encoding. Most of the gates that uh, FTME produced were highly irregular. And we can see that by looking at the median gate. So here's Hyperdate's median performing gate. Again, four legs together, bounding across the landscape, Basically, totally, all the legs are together in symmetry. And I would like to you to remember as we go further in the talk, this gate has four legs together. The previous gate had three legs together and one exception leg. So that's going to be important later on. But still, highly regular, uh, both in terms of legs being coordinated and repeated movement. The direct encoding, and this is much <laughs> more typical, <coughs> kind of looks like a fish out of water. You know, it's got the one leg flapping about in the breeze. I don't know what that thing's doing. <laughs> and it's got this leg up here that sometimes tripping at it, you know. At best, it looks like a highly wounded version <laughs> of a natural quadruped. But that's the medium performing game. The best indication of the reliability of an encoding is the worst performing game, which gets even more funny for the direct encoding. So Hyper-D here, this is its worst game. Again, it's going to trip a little bit. It's kind of like a puppy learning to run, but it's got coordination still. Its four legs are together, 
It's bounding across. It's got the same repeated movement over and over again. It's not as successful, but it's still highly regular and coordinated. The direct encoding, on the other hand, has each leg definitely now doing its own thing. <laughs> Nothing about that looks like a prey fleeing a predator. It's kind of hard to use the predator. That's right. Where's your baby ships? Maybe the predator thinks I'm definitely not eating that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right on my car. Bad karma. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, another way to look at the regularity of these gates is to plot the angles of each one of the joints, which I've done here. So, here is that gate with three legs together and one leg out of phase. The three legs are together here, and the orange is out of phase. And then that same thing is repeated over and over again through time. These two gates, which we saw from hypernia, as the median and minimum fitness, are perfectly coordinated and regular. The joint angles are right on top of each other. The direct encoding, on the other hand, while its fast gate was slightly regular, these are just a scrambled mess. And this is what's really typical of the direct encoding. Almost every gate just had joints flying kind of all over the place. Now, as I mentioned, being regular might make you more general. And the way to test generality in this system, we evolve gates for six seconds, which is this green line. But if we take that cap off and see how long can these things run if we give them as much time as possible before they fall over, what we can find is that the hibernate encoding was able to run far beyond the time it saw in evolution, which means it can generalize to new situations, whereas the direct encoding wasn't able to do that. And that's a significant difference. What's really fascinating to me, though, is to look at the brains themselves. So one of the great things about evolutionary computation is that with a few keystrokes, without cutting open skulls, we get to see the brains of these guys. We get to see every single neural wire and what happens. And what happens, if we look at that, the difference between the, an example hyperne brain and an example actine brain is that clearly this is much more regular than this. Now let me help you see what's going on here. These are cubes of brains. So the first sheet here, these yellow dots, those are the input nodes. And then behind that is slid in, the hit, is slid in the hidden layer, which are these pink dots here. And then behind that are the outputs. Now, green links are excitatory, which means they uh, amplify information. And red links dampen information, so they're inhibitory. And then we look at the same brain from the back, from the output side. And what we see is that the hybrid brain is highly regular. So there's one pattern repeated for every node, which is red on top and green on the bottom. You also see that there's a regulator where the input to hidden layer, at least on top, is all inhibitory, whereas here, it's all excitatory. And then if we look from the back, we can see there's a third regulator. There's a diagonal symmetry here. There's this pattern of a few red links surrounded by green links, and that pattern diffuses away from the bottom left node. So basically, there are these complicated geometric patterns here that hyperne is producing. The direct encoding, on the other hand, just looks like a scrambled mess. My eye cannot pick out any relevant regularities in that brain. And I flipped through all of the 50 uh, direct encoding controls that I ran in this experiment, and they all look irregular. Whereas all 50 of the hypernate brains look extremely regular. <clears throat> but what's also cool is that the hypernate brains don't all look like this. There's a vast array of diverse neural regularities produced by the hypernate encoding. So this is the brain we saw. It's got a pattern repeated for every node, and it's mostly got strong connections, which means that each one of the cylinders, the links here, is thick. This brain, on the other hand, has mostly thin connections, a different type of regularity, and it has left-right symmetry. This brain has diagonal symmetry. Here, it's kind of hard to see, but there's an exception for this node. There are red connections coming out of this node, but not for any of the other nodes on the output side. Here, we see an exception for a single column, and here, we see exceptions for the center column. So there's all sorts of different regular wiring patterns that hypernate is discovering that the direct encoding never discovered <coughs> on its own. What's also fascinating, <coughs> losing my voice here, is that you can actually look at the brains and infer the behavior just by looking at the brain. So I remember I told you there was one gate that has four legs together and the other gate that has three legs together and one leg out of phase. Here are three example brains from the four-way symmetric gate. And what we can see is each row controls a leg. And the neural wiring pattern for each row is virtually the same. For my eye, I can't detect a difference. And that's true for all of these example brains. Whereas here, one of the legs was different. And that is this top row here. And in all three brains, you can see that something different is happening in this top row. So it's kind of one of the holy grails of neuroscience, to be able to look at the brain and be able to guess the behavior. 
And I performed an informal experiment in which I was able to guess 90% of the gates just by looking at the brains, which is pretty fun. Now, I've been delivering relatively subjective estimations of the regularity of the brains just by looking at them, but we can also quantify that. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, compression is a measure of regularity. So if I take the brains from hyperne and I put them into text files, each one of the link values, and I hand that over to the gzip compression algorithm, and I do the same thing for the direct encoding, then the hyperne brains compress a lot more than the direct encoding brains, which means that they're more quantifiably regular, which supports the subjective observations we were making about from looking at the visualizations. What's also fascinating is that hyperd brains are more regular the more the problem uh, irregularity rises. So, yeah? We're, is that a measure of compression or a measure of the final file size? Because the numbers look backwards. It looks, no, the compression is greater for hyperd, which is why this number is larger. Probably the numbers. The correct. difference between uh, the, the uncompressed and the compressed. Yeah. Okay, so, the reg thank you for that. And feel free to, I'm, I'm doing okay, yeah, I guess I'm not doing great on time. <laughs> Maybe save your questions for the end. <laughs> All right, so, um, what's interesting is that as the irregularity of a problem goes up, just like the Fiddler crab, if you need some irregularities, you need more genomic information. So the genomes are larger as problems are more irregular. So on target weights, quadruped and bit mirroring, there's a positive correlation between irregularity and genome size. Now that wasn't significant in these two cases, although it was more almost significant in target weights. But on bit mirroring, it was highly significant and highly positive, and that's what I've pictured here. So as irregularity goes up, so does genome size. Okay, the final thing I want to point out is that hyper is more evolvable. And the way that I test that is I go through all the millions of organisms in all of my evolution experiments. I take the offspring and the parent, and I do the ratio of their fitness. And I say, is the offspring better than the parent? If it is, it's above this line, and the, the, the increase, uh, the, the better it is, the farther away it is from this line. And what we see is that for hyperne, there's a larger spread. So there's more horribly mutated offspring, and also more offspring that are doing much better than their parents. Now, it's not surprising that you get a lot of huge deleterious effects. Most mutations are bad, and in generative encoding, you're going to have more effects, because you can affect more parts of the genome. But what really shocked me is the number of, of hopeful monsters, if you will, horribly mutated creatures that are still performing really well. And that, I think, is what fuels the success of hyperne. So for example, above this dotted line, 6% of the hyperne offspring fall into this category, whereas only a fraction do for the, uh, the direct encoding. OK, I'm not going to get to the second part of the talk, but I just want to warn you, it's not nearly as long as the previous one. I'm almost done, <laughs> so bear with me here. Um, and this is, all of this has shown the benefits of regularity. But I'm not going to show a downside to regularity, which is that as problems become more irregular, the generative encoding doesn't perform as well. Now, if you think about it, I've shown you hyperdeep's performance increases with the regularity of a problem. But of course, the converse is true. As irregularity goes up, that means the generative encoding is performing less well. And I want to call your attention to one of the results we've already seen, which is this target weight result. So on the 90% regular problem, 90% of the weights in the network are one value. 10% of the weights are different. Within a handful of generations, hyperdeep exploits that regularity of the problem. Within over hundreds, hundreds of generations, it cannot make exceptions to account for those 10% irregular weights. It makes no fitness improvements here. So it can deal with regularity just fine, but it really struggles to make irregularity, you know, to account for irregularities. And so that raises the question of whether or not generative encodings would be better if somehow they could generate their own irregularity. And the way that we can test that is by combining generative and direct encodings. So generative encodings are good at exploiting irregularity, and direct encodings are good at handling irregularity. So what I did was invent an algorithm called hybrid, which just combines the both of them together. And the way it works is I first evolve with hybrid, and then I switch to the direct encoding. And the, the hypothesis is maybe fitness will rise on a flat line. And then, once the direct encoding is in control, it can fine tune and make adjustments that will increase performance. That's the hope. And now we can see if that works. So on target weights, gray here is hybrid. And what we see is that we truly are getting the best of both encodings. For example, on this 90% problem, the generative encoding gets the regularity of the problem. And then at the switch point, the uh, direct encoding immediately starts to account for the irregularities of the problem and performance immediately starts getting better than hyperd, which is this maroon line. 
And that occurred on all of these problems. Same story on bit mirroring. So as I scale the regularity from low to high, the black is bit mirroring, the red is hybrid, and on every single problem, hybrid either ties or beats hybrid. And that's often a significant difference, which is what these answers <coughs> are. I also tested in our challenging engineering problem, and we get the same result. So here is hybrid in black, hybrid in red, and here's the switch point. And what you notice is that for most of the experiments, hyperneeds basically run out of steam once it's halfway through the experiment. It's figured out the regularity of the problem, it can adjust and make it uh, do irregularities, and it's basically done. Whereas once we switch to the direct encoding, we get these performance spikes. And those spikes can be significant, sometimes as high as 64% improvement by putting both of these encodings together. And so what this to me indicates is that making some adjustments to these regular patterns can really lead to performance increases. And that tends to correlate with the irregularity of the problem. So the final data I'm going to show you is this slide, which is it's kind of fun to look at the specific changes that hybrid makes to the brains. So here are three example brains after the hyperneed phase, and then here's that same brain after the direct encoding is done with it. And so for example, here there was a regular pa uh, pattern of all red, and the direct encoding just made a couple of the links excitatory. Here, this brain is largely the same from our visual perspective, but here's this one major exception. This green link is totally ratcheted up which is a kind of exception we wouldn't expect hypernate to be able to make very easily, but the direct encoding does make. And then here you see this pattern mostly red up here, but now we're adding some excitatory connections throughout the brain. But the most interesting thing to me is that when you take a regular pattern by hypernate and you turn it over to the direct encoding, it doesn't completely fall apart. The regularity doesn't go away. The direct encoding is largely leaving the skeleton in place and just adjusting a few of the patterns in a few places. And that leads to those huge performance improvements. Now, I'll tell you, this came from the one faulty joint problem. If you go to the more irregular problems, there's a bigger difference here, because more irregularities need to be accounted for. But it's still basically the same case, that you can see the original pattern in the final brain. So what does hybrid tell us about generative encodings? I think there's a lot of interesting lessons. The fact that hybrid beats hyperne on every problem that we tested it on indicates that generative encodings are struggling to adjust their regular patterns in irregular ways. However, we don't have to live with that drawback. There's a remedy, and that remedy is suggested by hybrid, which offers us a path forward, which means that we use the generative encoding to, to produce the regularities, and then we have a process of refinement to adjust those regularities in an irregular way. Now, in this paper, I've used a generative encoding and then a direct encoding to, as the process of refinement. But you could also combine a generative encoding with a lifetime learning algorithm. So I'm just speculating here, but it might be the case that in biology, your genome is providing extremely regular neural wiring patterns, and then learning through your life is adjusting those patterns in irregular ways to account for the idiosyncrasies you encounter in the world. And in future work, I'd like to test that. Okay, before getting on to my conclusions, I'd like to quickly mention that I haven't had time to tell you about all the work that I've done here at Michigan State. In particular, there are two more chapters for my dissertation that investigate properties of hyperneed. I investigated its sensitivity to geometric representations, as well as whether or not it produces modular neural networks. I've also investigated the evolution of evolvability, learning, and altruism. That then brings us to future work. So there's tons of interesting things to do, and in fact, as this dissertation came uh, approached, I was increasingly thinking of all these things I'd like to do, and I just had to keep putting them on the back shelf as I got ready for this defense presentation. So there's a long list of things that I plan to get to the second I turn in this dissertation. <laughs> in all seriousness, I do plan to continue this work. Uh, this summer I'll be here in, in Michigan State investigating a lot of these properties, as well as uh, we just got good news that the NSF has funded a project looking at regularity, modularity, and hierarchy in hyperne, and I'll be working on that with Hod Lipson at Cornell in Ithaca. So, in conclusion, what I hope I've done in this dissertation is show a more comprehensive picture of generative encodings. As we, and the reason is because I've tested them across a continuum of regularity. And what we found is that generative encodings can increase, can, I'm sorry, can exploit problem regularity to increasingly outperform direct encodings as the regularity of a problem increases. And they've done that by producing regular brains that have visually complicated regularities. They also produce behaviors that are also regular and coordinated. 
and that on the whole, they're more evolvable. But I've also investigated the downside to generative encodings and their bias towards regularity, which is that generative encodings struggle with irregularity. But hybrid offers us a path forward, which is that, and it suggests something really interesting, which a lot of people in generative encoding haven't been focused on, which is that generative encodings are, are not necessarily a silver bullet to be used on their own. They don't necessarily need to be a standalone algorithm that does everything. We can use the generative encoding as kind of the regularity generating engine within a larger algorithm in combination with the process of refinement. So at the highest level, I hope that I've shown you today that generative encodings can produce complex, natural brains and behavior. And that therefore, because they're able to do that, they should play a major role in our efforts to synthetically evolve creatures that are as capable, intelligent, and complex as those in the natural world. We've got certain organs that are only on one side of us. 
and the fiddler crab you know, has a different claw. And even though your brain on the very high level is left, right symmetric, there are big differences between the two, the, the two spheres, or the two hemispheres, sorry. And so I think the ability to be able to produce a regular pattern, but also adjust it in certain places to account for irregularities is important. Uh, and is something that nature has figured out that we need to figure out. Yeah. Do you think, um, so think about your findings with the hybrid stuff, do you think that might inform biologists who are looking at, say, developmental gene regulation networks with the type of encodings we might see in that gene regulation, both generative and direct encoding, with an angle that deal with both regularities and irregularities, which can be nature does pretty well. Yeah, so one of my questions is, I don't know, at least in the brain, I don't know how much of the irregularity is encoded into the genome versus arises, say, due to learning. So it could be that nature is just offloading the irregularity in a lot of ways to, to learning. But obviously, in terms of the organ, the bodies, and, and probably the brain as well, there are some irregularities that are hard-coded. And I just, I don't know to the extent to which, and we can ask you, you and Titus, I don't know the extent to which developmental biologists know this, but I think it's fascinating to look both at the irregularities, but also where that uh, asymmetry and irregularity is encoded. So I know there's been a lot of work, for example, on when asymmetry gets started in organisms and whatnot, but I don't know yet if we kind of think about classifying genes, and it might be kind of too simplistic, into the ones that produce regular patterns and the ones that produce irregular patterns. But I think it'd be fun to kind of find a gene that turns on only in one half and creates some sort of a genetic uh, cascade that is producing the difference over here that's not seen over here. Um, references available on request. References available. <laughs> <laughs> Transition. Hours and hours of reading for me to do. <coughs> Which I look forward to. I absolutely love reading about model biology. It's fascinating. Jeff. So, so for the direct encoding, you can kind of think of the genotype as each individual weight in the neural network. Yep. So to what extent does the generative encoding just make you have bigger mutational differences available or a higher mutation rate kind of response to your other work that you've done. It's a fantastic question. So one of the experiments. Yep. So one of the things that I've done is I swept the mutation rate of both encodings to see if, if I just raise the mutation rate of the direct encoding, does that help it uh, compensate? And the answer is no. And I think the answer is somewhat obvious because you can't get coordinated mutations. So I don't think it's the number or the magnitude, I think it's the fact that they're coordinated. A mutation in, in hyperdata is affecting more of the brain, but it's doing it in a coordinated way. But just and here's a control I really want to do, and it wouldn't be you uh, I'm planning on doing it. I can do the exact, I can take every parent offspring in hyperdate, see what its mutational effect is, how many links it affects, then go to the direct encoding version of that same brain and apply that same number of mutations, and I can guarantee you that the fitness changes will be huge. The direct encoding will be horribly mutated and have no, you know, be poor, and the general encoding will still largely be okay. Uh, but I'd like to do that too. Any other questions? Charles? No. Okay, well thank you very much. I appreciate you coming.